Welcome to today, the last day of ECOTS. My name is Nicholas Horton from Amherst College and the ECOTS Program Committee. You've been muted, as you know, at this point, but you can post questions to the Q&A and comments in the chat. The session is being recorded. We'll be answering questions as we have time at the end of the session. I'm really pleased that we have uh, Judith Kenner, Alana Unfried, and Roxy Peck with us uh, today. Alana is an assistant professor of statistics at Cal State University, Monterey Bay. She completed her PhD in statistics at NC State in 2016. Her research interests focus on statistics education, including statistical service learning, co-requisite courses, and the development of validation of instruments assessing attitudes towards statistics. Dr. Judith Kanner received her PhD in biomathematics and zoology from NC State. She joined the, the mathematics and stat department at CSU Monterey Bay in 2010, and since established the statistics minor and the statistics concentration, and she became the statistics program coordinator for their new statistics BS program. She's also the current chair of the Sigma on stat ed and the chair of the ASA joint committee on undergraduate statistics. Roxy Peck, our third speaker is Professor Emerita of Statistics at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. She was a faculty member there for 30 years and served in a huge number of leadership positions. Roxy has been honored in all sorts of ways in the profession. She's been named a fellow of the American Statistical Association, received the ASA Founders Award and the US COTS Lifetime Achievement Award. Let me, without further ado, um, turn things over to this esteemed panel who, in great appreciation, this West Coast All-Star team got up early uh, for us to be able to participate in the, the Monday hot topic. Um, I'd love to start at this point um, by starting to ask some questions. And I guess the question I'd first ask of Roxy is, what's the next thing you would have wanted to say in your session, but didn't have time? Thanks, Nick. And I'm going to uh, share a screen here for just a second. Uh, let me see if I can get this up and going. Yeah, so so one of the, the things, I, several people emailed me and, and asked about one of the things that I had said. And so I thought that that's where I would uh, just take two minutes and, and do that. Um, and that, as I had mentioned, um, a, the value that I found in the sh in short focusing activities as a way of starting classes. And a couple people emailed and asked about examples, uh, if I could show a few examples. And so I thought I would do that. Um, what you're looking at, I'm going to th show just uh, three, and we won't do the actual activity or the discussion, but I just wanted to show examples of how, what that might look like. Um, one of the ones that I do is uh, to put up a graph of what's wrong with this graph. And um, you can probably see this is a famous one that's been out this week um, that came out of the Georgia governor's office um, and that's a perfect uh, good discussion example of what's wrong with this graph and uh, when students look at this um, hopefully they will notice that this is to show that their decline in cases of COVID-19 justifying their startup um, but if you look carefully at the axis you'll notice that the dates are not arranged in order um, they're arranged to make it look like it's going down and even within the the groups um, they change the order of the uh, of the different colored bars, uh, the order is changed again to make it, give the appearance of going down. So it's a good thing for students to look at. It doesn't take long. Hopefully they can see what's ridiculous about this graph. And then just to show you, uh, a day before yesterday on CNN, the governor's office um, responded uh, with their defense to this graph and they said it was accurate but arranged differently than people expected. <laughs> I thought that was, uh, that, that could actually be a good point of discussion for one of these focusing activities as well. Um, another type of activity that I use, I make use of the uh, what's going on in this graph, graphs from the New York Times website. Um, and I often will just take a graph. This is one of the first ones that was used there um, where they show the um, uh, percent of nutrition is saying a food is healthy on one axis, percentage of all Americans saying a food is healthy on the other axis. And I just ask students to think about in small groups to, to write a headline that could be used with this graph that would convey the message. Again, that's another quick starting uh, starting one. And then another one that I like to use is um, to uh, which one of these doesn't belong and why. Uh, so this is an example from the area of graphical displays where I show them three different graphical displays. One's a pie chart. Uh, 
uh, on data uh, from a survey asking people which fictional character most needs life insurance. Um, and then just uh, some segmented bar charts looking at um, uh, how much time people spend in different categories. And then a time series uh, plot of percentage of Americans who exercise for 30 minutes um, at least three times a week. And I asked them, which one of these doesn't belong? And there's actually, you can make lots of different arguments about which one is the one that doesn't uh, doesn't belong, but based on categorical variable versus numerical, one variable versus two variables, um, compare making a comparison, those kinds of things. And so I asked them to uh, pick something that, which one of these they don't think belongs and make an argument, and then to actually pick something else they think doesn't belong with the other two and make an argument. And so those are just the kinds of things that just take a couple of minutes and that uh, can get students to, um, kind of just involved in a discussion may or may not be related to the exact topic that we're doing that day but always related to statistics and helps them to get um, to engage with statistics and also to, to talk statistics which is another uh, thing that I like to do so anyway so that's the thing that I didn't get to do in my uh, in my session and that people have asked for and now I've done it Great, Roxy. Well, thank you very much. That certainly does uh, kind of tie directly into our theme of engaging everyone. Alana, what's the next thing you would have wanted to say but didn't have time to say in your session from Monday? Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm going to follow up similarly to Roxy with things that I heard people wanted more information on um, that we just didn't have time for. One was how we set group norms in the classroom. Um, so I shared this link after our session, but I'm not sure if everyone was still around. So I'm going to post it again now in the chat. Um, this is a link to an activity called Setting the Stage that's created by Dana Ernst, who's a mathematics professor who focused as, focuses a lot on inquiry-based learning. And so I've basically taken his activity directly and put it into all of my classes on the first day of class as a way to set the stage for what that inquiry perspective looks like to get students interested in learning and seeing the importance of um, learning themselves. Another phrase that he talks about that I really like is the phrase productive failure, that we can fail at things and that it's productive for learning. And so I phrase that on the first day of class as a way to think about struggling with math and statistics that it can be something productive and we want to have an opportunity in class to have those productive failures. Um, and again, this is really speaking to those students that have the highest statistics and mathematics anxiety. Um, they will often come up to me after the very first day of class and say, oh my goodness, I was so afraid to take this class, but you've made me feel so much better already that I know that you're going to help me figure out how to do this. Um, another thing that came up a, a lot was just wanting to talk more about how to do this remotely with with virtual learning uh, which is a big issue for me too um, the entire CSU system is going virtual in the fall so I'll be continuing to think about this over the summer but a couple more details I would have given on how um, we transitioned online um, to a partially synchronous and partially asynchronous class um, we have we meet it's a three unit class we meet um, for two sessions a week, an hour and 20 minutes. And so what we did is we moved the first 30 minutes of class to an asynchronous portion. So every class period would just meet half an hour later than usual. Um, and during that time, students were expected to go watch the videos that had been posted, but they were posted in advance. So if that time wasn't convenient for students, they could watch them the night before some other time. Those videos really covered the mini lectures that I would have given in class. Um, we do also have somewhat of a flipped classroom approach where students are expected to read the section of the book ahead of time before class. So basically the, the mini lectures would re-emphasize things from the book that I wanted to give a little more clarity on. And then the synchronous session that started late would be the, that active component where they've already been introduced to the material and now we're going to practice and they have time to work through a full example um, um, with a group to kind of work on that that activity component so that's the what the structure of our classes looked like after we went online great Alana that's uh, I think really interesting because I think so many people have been teaching in a flipped as well as online format and kind of the pivoting that we did this semester and thinking about kind of strategies like that to combine both asynchronous and synchronous again working on that engagement aspect Judith, I'd love to ask you if you could ask a question of Roxy. Any Anything burning questions you have for her at this point? I mean, I have so many questions, but oh. <laughs> just because she knows so much. 
Um, but thinking about both our presentation and her presentation, something that stood out to me is the uh, quote unquote cons of really moving to this truly active activity based type of learning, which is the faculty burden and also the class time implications. And so I would love to hear any wisdom you have on how faculty can manage that time, both the time preparing outside of the classroom, but also the time inside the classroom, because I know we all feel that pressure of, ah, oh, we got to get through the syllabus, we got to get through the material. Um, and that hasn't gone away, even though we truly believe in this form of, of pedagogy. Well, so I think that um, one of the things that helped me was um, finally coming to terms with the difference between what I cover and what students learn. Um, and so I used to joke about, well, I can, you know, if you want me, now this was back in the, the uh, lower tech days, but, you know, to say, you know, I can cover twice as, want me to cover twice as much, just give me two overhead projectors and I can, just, you know, I, I can cover twice as much. That doesn't mean that the students are going to, um, to, to learn um, anymore. And the other thing that I have ha that's really helped me to manage um, to, to really create the in-class time that I need to do these kinds of things is to really reorganize. It's kind of not quite the same strategy. It's not quite a flipped classroom, but it's to think much more carefully about what I'm asking students to do outside of class because I found when I would start class and I would tell students, you know, for every hour in class, I think you know, you should be spending, you know, two to three hours outside of class. Um, and, you know, it kind of dawned on me one day that if I really believe that, um, that I should be spending a lot more time thinking about that part of the class. I'm really telling them the more majority of the classes is, is outside of class and recognizing that the time I spent thinking about what they were doing was the five minutes I spent picking out homework problems um, and just assume they could figure out what else they were supposed to be doing. And so um, uh, I started doing much more structured um, kind of assignments so, you know, to, that said more of, if I think you're going to spend two hours outside of class, here's how I picture you spending that time. And I was able to move a lot more of the just the information transfer. And that could in, include uh, watching the kinds of videos that you guys are producing and things like that to, to have that be occurring, still an important part of the course, but not something that I need to devote um, devote class time to. And then also trying to make, I found that students resist reading the book if they know that you're just going to tell them what's in the book when they come to class. But if they realize that you aren't going to just tell them what's in the book, then they actually will read the book. Uh, but you have to kind of, they have to understand that, um, that that's an expectation. So those are just a few of the thoughts. <laughs> Great. That idea that the majority of time is spent out inside of class, but to, to reflect our preparation is a really, really good one, Roxy. Well, turnabout's fair play. Roxy, do you have any questions for, for Judith? Yeah, so so I've been, um, I, I think, a, a real fan or advocate of the, the changes that have been happening in developmental mathematics, and uh, because I've always thought that, you know, we send a weird message to um, to students when they get their letter in the mail, congratulations, you've been accepted to, to college. And then a week later, they get the letter saying, oh, by the way, you're not ready for college work. And you know, so it's kind of like, oh, by the way, we expect you to fail. And now you're going to have to do all these other things. And so I really like the, uh, the move to co-requisite instruction and things like, and, and models like that. And I've also been a fan of the commingling. But I, uh, something that I hadn't really thought about carefully that came up in your talk that I really have been thinking about um, since I first heard Elena mention it at, at uh, JSM and then more um, in your talk here is the way you form the groups and the message that that sends to students um, uh, about the doing the random assignment as a way of kind of very subtly conveying the message that, um, that everyone has um, uh, brings value to the group and we expect everyone to be able to contribute and not here are the good ones and here are the, the ones that need help. Um, and I was wondering about whether you got pushback um, from your colleagues on that aspect of the course and also uh, how you got buy-in from your colleagues on the whole idea of complex instruction um, as, as well and whether that was a difficult process or whether you were able to, to sell it uh, sell it convincingly. Sure. I, we get this question a lot, especially about the, the buy-in, um, because this isn't something we're just doing in intro stat. We're doing this across all of our statistics and math courses, and we're in different stages of implementation, for sure. 
uh, because it does take time to really, um, it's not something you can just do at once. It takes time to develop the tasks, refine them, go back again, think about it. And so it's a process for sure. Um, I I'm sometimes uh, feel bad because we have a really amazing department at CSUMB who really care about students and um, really work together very well. And so when it came to, um, for those who don't know, in 2017, the chancellor of the CSU system basically said, no more remediation. You were doing either stretch or co-rec. So we didn't have a lot of choice in the matter. Um, and instead of waiting around to see if there, we could push back, we just kind of heads down, started working and thinking about this. And, and we also just started thinking about what would we like to see um, happen? Uh, so uh, the training professional development that we offered, we did in the spring before we implemented probably over 40 hours of just professional development and training within our department. Um, that does require resources, um, but it's resources that pay off in the long run. Um, and then we've done, um, one of the other things we've done too is with our general education classes where we have these co-recs, um, is we've made them um, highly co coordinated. Uh, so there's a course coordinator who oversees um, the curriculum um, and also uh, helps just sort of manage and uh, do sort of just-in-time professional development, if you will, with some of the lectures, especially when we have new lectures coming in. We do have the benefit of having lectures who have been there a long time and they participated in the training with us. Um, but this is something we're dealing with right now. This past year, we brought in brand new lectures and uh, they had to have this training and we realized, okay, we really need to up the level of professional development training we are providing for our lectures. Um, so it's it's really investing in uh, those that are teaching, right? And taking and re recognizing resources. Often we say, okay, go teach that count class, right? But we need to invest in the resources, our best our resources into the lectures um, and other faculty that we hire so that they are, they feel comfortable and supported um, in the process. And there has been some um, pushback or a uh, pushback always seems like a strong word. I would say questioning because the, you know, we have wonderful, uh, when I say lectures, that's just a categorization of faculty, but we have lectures who, um, who teach all over the place. Right. And so coming here, then they're asked, we're asking them to teach a very specific way. Um, but still, you know, respecting their freedom, uh, within the classroom. Um, but I think most of them have actually bought in over time, uh, once they see, once we have set the expectations for them um, too about what is actually expected out of the entirety of the semester. And we understand you're not gonna be able to like get to regression by you know, week 10 because it's just the way things go, right? Um, so it's still a process, uh, but I think just communication um, and coordination have really helped us in this process um, to just, and then that ongoing professional development, um, we can't just do it once and expect it to be done. Great. Thank you very much, Judith. That's that's great. Alana, in your in the talk, you mentioned that you did activities with your students in the synchronous part of the class. Um, can you talk a little bit about the format, what the alternative would be for students who couldn't make it at that appointed time or whose internet flaked out on them? And, and did you feel that those alternatives worked well? Yeah, this is a good question. And I feel like my answer for what we did in the spring would differ from what I would say about the fall. In the spring, um, with the chaos of moving online and knowing students were dealing with a lot, we went with the approach of just being extremely accommodating. Um, and so if you emailed me and said, my internet's not working, or I couldn't make it to class because of something, I would just say, that's fine. I'm going to give you participation points for today. Um, here's what we talked about. Let me know if you have any questions, right? Um, moving into the fall, I'm planning to approach it more like I would a physical classroom. You're expected to be in class, right? Um, there's participation points for being in class and working in your group. If you have a valid reason for missing that class period, um, let me know and I will um, let you make up the work by showing me that you completed the activity on your own is probably how I would handle that. Um, but yeah, the, the spring was just so chaotic that we tended to just be on that over accommodating side of pretty much if you can't make it, I will do everything in my power to get you the materials that you need and make sure that everything's okay. Great. So while you're while, while I have you, um, do you have a kind of a sense of what you hope participants might be taking away from this year's ECOTS thinking a little bit more holistically? 
Yeah, I really loved the theme of engaging everyone. Judith and I were so excited when we saw the topic because it played into everything that we're doing at Monterey Bay with moving to the co-requisite system, um, adapting all our classes for complex instruction. I hope everyone leaves with a sense that through all of the great talks we've heard, there really are ways to engage everyone. And when you think about that student who just seems unmotivated in your class or acts like they don't want to be involved or participate. Um, remember that there are reasons that they have that attitude that can be overcome based on the way that we treat them and work with them in class so that we really can uh, engage everyone in our classrooms. Roxy, what do you hope people take away from this, this year's ECOTS? Well, I, I think what Alana just said is really, really important. I would, I would hope that uh, people embrace the theme of the conference and look at engagement at on a lot of different kinds of levels, um, that it isn't just necessarily one one dimensional. Um, but then I would also hope, um, and that's my hope whenever uh, we ha have one of the either electronic or in-person conferences and what I get when I go to these kinds of conferences is that people would um, become reinvigorated in terms of thinking about their teaching and, and the way that they can interact with with students. Um, I know that I get a lot out of just hearing all of the exciting things that other people are doing. I may not be able to take every idea that I hear and, and take it back into my own classroom, uh, but uh, just hearing about it makes me think carefully about the, my teaching and what I'm doing, and, and um, I think that's invaluable. And so I would hope that people from the, all of the, the different presentations this week um, were able to get that um, and, and carry that back with them as they start thinking about uh, what things might look like in the fall. Judith? Um, I, I think one of the biggest things I've taken away and from other, some of the other sessions too, um, that concept of engagement, we're moving even before you know, the whole pandemic, higher ed, higher ed was already moving in a direction where the traditional student body of 18 to 22 year olds was not that traditional student. The idea of a non-traditional student was becoming blurrier. Um, and so I, I really think this, the concept of this whole conference and seeing the student as a whole person and, and part of what we were talking about and recognizing um, their abilities and telling them that and, and assigning them status uh, because you're going to have more students who are older, or we have a lot of students who are veterans, um, or students who are going to be returning after a career in something else as the economy shifts, um, that we really need to pay attention to the whole student and how we engage them um, in our classroom. And I was just um, really uh, impressed, I think, too, about how fast people talked about and adapted to everything that happened this, this semester or quarter for you. Um, but yeah, just really seeing our students as these, these whole people um, who are there for a reason. And so it's our privilege to sort of engage them and, and help them uh, become better learners of statistics. Great, I think that, that aspect of kind of the diversity of students, you know, ELL, accommodations, kind of diverse ages, backgrounds, um, and now kind of locations even for folks who were previously residential. Um, I think that focus on how one creates an inclusive um, and welcoming environment that challenges and supports students is I think a challenge for all of us and I think you've all modeled uh, that in some really productive ways. Any surprises, Judith, anything from ECOTS that you weren't expecting or that um, you know, kind of struck you in some ways? You know, now I'm thinking posters, other kind of conversations, other sessions. I think um, from U.S. COTS to, you know, I, I was at U.S. COTS last year and there was this discussion about how do we shift this conference to be thinking about more of like upper division statistics and not just intro statistics. And I was really impressed um, by the level of sophistication, there were several talks about artificial intelligence and grading and automated feedback and, and really um, sophisticated technology. Um, I think there's often this concept of, and not just, by the way, in upper division stats classes, often these things are being done in lower division um, stats classes. And we often think, oh, well, students can't handle R or Python and interest stat. And yet we have instructors out there who, um, who have been doing really innovative things with, with the technology side of engagement. And so 
um, that I think is the, I guess the, the surprise uh, was just how sophisticated things have become. And it's given me a whole slew of things to look at this summer, especially as we move virtually this, this fall. Great, Alana? Yeah, I think I always expect so much good from our statistics education community that I wasn't surprised by this, but so appreciative that it met my expectations. And that was all of the conversation around online learning. Um, that's, again, like I said, huge on my mind for the fall. I'm going to spend most of my summer preparing for online classes in the fall. And so I was so appreciative to have many great sessions about thinking about what that looks like for a great statistics class. Roxy, any surprises? Well, one surprise for me, um, in addition to the things that have already been mentioned, was the level of participation in the conference. I, I wasn't sure, given everything that's been going on this semester and all the demands on people's uh, times and, and everybody having this sense of being frazzled, um, I wasn't, wasn't sure what the, the participation would be at ECOTS this year. And the fact that there are like almost 100 people online right now watching this discussion um, just says to me, um, ju it is, is surprising in the best possible way um, in terms of, of the community coming out to support both um, ECOTS, but also to support each other in, in what everybody's trying to do and accomplish. And I, I find that inspiring. That's, that, that's great. Well, we've got some other questions uh, that have come in on the, on the chat window, um, maybe just kind of like lightning answers. Um, uh, any best sites for engaging activities we can use? Uh, Roxy, do you want to kind of start off and then Judith and Alana? Well, uh, Causeweb is one. What's going on with this graph is another. Um, and then um, the, the rest, are, there's just a, a wealth of things spread all over, but those are two that come to mind right away. Great. Judith, any favorites to add on to that list? Um, Roxy just took mine, um, but I'll also say that I'm involved in both the section on statistics and data science education from the ASA side and then the MAA Sigma Stat Ed um, and, and also ISO stats, which, uh, and the, the, those communities all seem to be very open about sharing things. And so if you put out a call to any of those communities, you will often get a lot of great responses. Um, and if, yeah, I have a whole little bookmark thing of stuff that I share from Twitter as well, which sounds weird, but I find a lot on Twitter. <laughs> great, Alana? Yeah. I would also add Alan Rossman's blog, Ask Good Questions, has been great for just bigger picture questions to build an activity around, and I'm planning to mine a lot of that this summer for adapting into our course. Great, so I'm just putting some of these in the chat window. Um, uh, you know, I've got, um, uh, there's also Joe Harden has put together a list of summer activities for students uh, on the Teach Data Science blog uh, that includes some of the Tidy Tuesday activities. Um, there's another question. Um, as you move into the fall, and uh, what's one other thing that you're considering doing to engage students during the difficult times that you haven't previously done? Again, you've talked a little bit about changing expectations now that we're kind of no longer in kind of reactive mode, but um, maybe going in the opposite opposite direction. Um, Alana, any kind of additional things as you think about this time to plan for the fall? I think just ha coming up with more ways to force students in a sense to talk about themselves outside of the statistics classroom. Um, so I heard some great ideas from ECOTS about making sure to ask questions like, you know, what kind of music are you listening to today? What's your favorite thing you did over the summer? Just getting students to engage with each other outside of just focusing on the stats classroom. Um, I did a little bit of that in the spring. Their participation questions for the day um, were something like that, like one, what's one thing that's relieving your stress right now? And that was just a great way to connect with students on things that we can all have in common outside of the statistics environment to get us connected on that more personal level. Roxy, any? Well, so, so I'm not actually, I'm retired now, so I'm not as in the classroom quite as much, but I am still, I'm trying to figure, grapple with some of the same issues because I've been doing a lot of professional development, especially for community colleges in California. And so um, uh, looking at how to take, can we still have effective professional development for instructors on how to do things like activity-based learning in an online environment? And so that's, I've been working on that and I've gotten a number of ideas from the conference on, on how I might handle the workshop coming up in two weeks with Central Valley folks. 
So we just had a related question on professional development, Roxy. Can you say one more word? What are the implications for PD as we as we kind of are in this mode and thinking about other kind of approaches to engaging our students? Well, I mean, I think a lot of what we're learning about uh, what's going on in our classrooms is is going to be carried over to how we deal with professional development. I think there are some actually interesting possibilities in that, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of these in person workshops where you reach, you know, maybe, you know, 50 to, you know, to 70 instructors at a time. Um, but if we're able to pull this off on a in an online environment, um, I think the potential to reach if we can make it effective I think we can reach people um, that that don't come to these in-person professional development so it, it could have a, if we can pull it off I think it could have a big big impact well well Roxy um, you got the first word as the oh. keynote on Monday <laughs> going to give you the benefit there of the last word but just thank you uh, Judith and Alana for all you've done and thanks for what I think is a really interesting hot topic from Monday Looking forward, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a break right now, um, and then the next, the Tuesday Hot Topic, will start in about 14 minutes. Um, we have some activities with Dollar Street and even more about clickers and personal response systems. There are posters from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's been neat going back there and seeing what the comments and conversations have happened there. But I just want to take one more opportunity to thank Judith, Alana, and Roxy, and then everyone else who's really made ECOTS possible this year. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Thank you.